Hey everybody, my name's Garrett. I'm Will. And I'm Greg. And you're listening to the D Plus cast where we discuss everything Disney Plus and beyond in streaming entertainment. On today's show, we unlock Premiere Access to discuss Disney's latest installment in their Rolodex of remakes. D do people know what a Rolodex is anymore? Did I just date myself? Yeah. Anyways, we're talking Disney's Mulan. Stick around. Loyal, brave, and true. It is my duty to protect my family. Ancestors, please protect her. What is your name, soldier? Hua Jun, Commander, son of Hua Zhou. We're going to make men out of every single one of you. Hey guys, how you doing? Hanging in there, All man. Right. Yeah, doing the thing. It's really hot where you guys are, isn't it? It's so hot. It's so hot. It it's is so hot. hundred and it was. I believe yesterday was hundred and eighteen degrees here in the valley. Good it's lord. ridiculous. It's too yeah. much. It's too much to bear. I want to come back, but I see stuff like that, and I'm just like, hey. Sh My neighborhood is like dead. Apparently, everybody wanted to like leave for this weekend, but where did they go? Like, is this the weekend you really want to be in Palm Springs? I don't right. think so. Yeah. Uh, Vegas? No, I don't want to be in Vegas this weekend. Mm -mm. Anyway, who's going to Vegas right now? Anyway, you got to be a you got to be insane to be going to Vegas during the pandemic. That's got to be a giant, disgusting petri dish. Yep. <laughs> 100%. Speaking of insane, uh, so we spent $30 to unlock Premiere Access on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. Some might consider that insane. Uh, a truth be told, I paid the $30 and provided Will and Greg my password, which I should probably change now because I think I use that for that password for other things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Look, we, I'm going to go, but uh, I'm... <laughs> During this podcast, I'm going to be logging into all your stuff. <laughs> we spent $30 among the three of us. Uh, Greg, I know you have some thoughts about Premiere Access, quote unquote. Well, yeah. Well, there's the phrase Premiere Access. What does that mean? It, it infers that it's opening and unlocking a whole corner of the app that you previously didn't have access to. And suddenly you do. You have Premiere Access. But it turns out all that means is you can watch this one movie. Yeah, which makes me wonder, are they going to, like, is Premiere Access only going to be for the, like, newest release? So if they do Black Widow in a couple of months, will Mulan then move to the normie access that I have? Well, M Mulan is scheduled to be available to all Disney Plus subscribers on December 4th. Gotcha. So I was wondering how long it would stay. Yeah, so it's, it's they're really just doing a, yeah, October, no, they're doing a 90-day window, sort of like the 90-day theater window um, they're just doing for Premiere Access. It's just a really weird angle to call it Premiere Access and to, to, to be like, oh, I have the Premiere Access version of Disney+, Plus, which is the same thing, plus one movie. Well, they come out with all sorts of weird... They name things so many weird things. Like, I, it, Premiere Access is in, in line with their Disney Parks annual passes, and the highest one you can have is a Premiere Pass, which gets you into Disneyland and Walt Disney World in Florida. Right, so so they're like, hey, we got this word premiere, and let's add this to Disney Plus. Now I don't know if you guys remember when Disney Plus was starting, and they said you can become part of the Founders Circle. Certainly don't remember. That. I do not recall. <laughs> no. The founder, the Founders Circle was basically saying like, hey, if you pay for three years of Disney Plus right now, we'll give you a, a special price where you save right. like. X amount of dollars per year. But yeah, that sounds familiar. I remember it was something like it. It it it, it ended up being like closer to like three dollars a month instead yeah. of what we're paying, which is like seven dollars a month. Yeah, and it's yeah. funny because there are people who, it it, it it's like people who have a timeshare and call themselves an owner. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, you know, there are people who, who have like one share of, of Disney stock and they wonder why they weren't informed of an acquisition of Fox 
You know, yeah, how great. come I wasn't told about this? Like, okay, well. Uh, so there are people who being part of the quote unquote founder circle, it's exciting and important to them. So that is why Disney comes up with these words because they, they must test well among their core audience. So they put a big gold bl- box up there that says premier access and you pay the $30 and you're in. It does, I think what you're saying though, Greg, it does make me feel like I should be getting access to more things too. Um, but I'm not because I didn't pay for it. So, you know, I'm good. Garrett, Garrett should be getting more things. Yeah, I should. Right, I right, should, right. Yeah. Garrett should be. <laughs> so I, I sat down, I watched Mulan. I don't know, where do you guys want to start with, with Mulan? Should we should we go back in the past to the time machine and and take a look at 1998 and sort of... Build some context. Think, yeah, let's 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 yeah. build some context. Let's Garrett start loves some from context. The oh, I yeah. love context. So Mulan came out in 1998, and that was sort of like the tail end of the animation renaissance of the 90s for Walt Disney Animation. You know, you're coming off the heels of Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, and then slowly Hunchback of Notre Dame, and mm-hmm. then you know Mulan. Hercules and Mulan. Hercules, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then Mulan, and then after Mulan, uh, the last one before you know Y two K happened and the world ended was Tarzan, and I don't think people look back at Tarzan as a classic, uh, but Mulan grossed three hundred million dollars worldwide, and I didn't know it grossed that much. No, I didn't either. Uh, I actually, I, I purposefully did not watch the the original Mulan before watching the new Mulan. But after watching the new Mulan, I did go back and watch the original Mulan to sort of compare and contrast. Um, did have When was the last time you guys watched the original Mulan, if you have at all? I, uh, I've only seen it once, and it was definitely after the the heyday. Of, it wasn't in 1998. It was probably sometime when I was in college when I realized, oh, you know what? I hadn't seen that one. That one actually has some really good buzz, despite, again, happening after the, the, the boom of Aladdin, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid. Um, so I did go back and watch that a few years ago, and I remember liking it, but I don't remember too much else about it and haven't revisited it since. So for me, I uh, it took a while to actually get around to actually watching it. I think I got introduced to it through Kingdom Hearts, the video game that dips into a lot of different Disney worlds. Um, and with someone putting Make a Man Out of You on a summer jock jams from a summer camp I was part of. <laughs> a great song. Uh, so that's my main intro to Mulan. I think I did finally get around to actually seeing it You know, within the past couple of years. Um, and I like it. It's good. The music is a lot of fun, and the animation's cool, and it's got a good story. So I'm a new fan of it, but I like it. Yeah, it doesn't quite have like Circle of Life or Akuna Matata, right. but but I was watching it today, and a lot of a lot of those songs really slap. You know, yeah, uh, uh, they're just a lot of fun. And the with reflection, the reflection song. It's a it's an excellent, excellent. Uh, I I want I wish ballad that mm-hmm. Howard Ashman would be very proud of. Yeah, and I think that that was a really nice touch in this new film that they used pieces of the reflection song in the um, in the soundtrack. It yeah. was kind of it was there. It was la- it was laid in. It wasn't in your face. It wasn't the big loud musical that the original one was. But it they they paid homage. That was kind of nice. Yeah, there are definitely nods, but there are some big differences. So. Uh, the original Mulan was popular with American audiences, but also very popular with Chinese audiences. But, you know, with two different cultures, you have two different reactions. And I think over in China, a dragon named Mushu, voiced by Eddie Murphy, was, was mm. one that they were not that, that too keen on. Yeah, you can see how that might come off as a little offensive, like naming the character after, like, one of the few Chinese food dishes that we could, here in America, can name. Like, that seems pretty... <laughs> pretty kind of gross and surfacy and and i it, i totally get why that character was completely left out from this movie yeah it, it's it's funny because they they disney decides to eliminate mushu from this live action remake and you know surprise surprise a lot of a lot of white people i see on facebook just really upset really upset that there's no mushu and no no songs and really just can't they can't see beyond their own shadow. 
and and I think when we talk in depth about this remake, we'll see what what they were able to achieve by sort of leaving a lot of the animated feature, you know, in the dust. But, you know, you have that you have that added challenge of we talk all the time about how Hollywood is making creative choices so to attract Chinese audiences because they are a huge market for Hollywood. With Mulan, you had two objectives. You had to attract the Chinese audience while also paying homage and honoring their culture as well, which I don't think the animated version, I don't think you could really argue that it truly honored Chinese culture. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's... I, I mentioned before we got on the air that I, I just recently went back and watched Peter Pan, the 1953 movie, and that movie is whew. bad. Um, and I don't mean I mean bad from like a con I mean it's like you know problematic is a nice way to describe it um I don't think the 1998 Mulan is problematic in those same ways but it definitely is not going that an extra step to honor a culture um like maybe that we see with this most recent one so I'm sure we'll get into that but uh but yeah I, I definitely see where you're coming from so let's let's talk about the pros and cons of this Mulan what did you guys think worked? What did you guys think didn't work? Uh, I think all in all, it was it, it worked. I mean, the action sequences, uh, the fight choreography, there's some really, really unique, cool uh, fight scenes. There's, a, there's this really sweet behind-the-back double arrow shot, right? And then the witch has this fight style with her sleeves and claws that's just like really awesome it's yeah, just i want i want to park yeah. on that because i think that is what this movie truly achieves is really thrilling action sequences some battle scenes that you know at times you know i was watching it thinking you know why didn't game of thrones light their stuff like this so i could yep. maybe see what was going on yeah um, it's, it's so sort of, vibrant yeah. And like it's it's easy to see and 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 again there's like some very unique action stuff. There's stuff in it where you go like I've never seen them I've never seen a movie do that before in a fight scene. So that that was kind of really a highlight, I think. Definitely. And I think they definitely sort of uh pilfered from kung fu movies. I I do have to say like one of my blind spots is Asian film in general. Um it's just something that I haven't truly explored. Never really explored. Well, you've got it, HBO so. Max, bro. You should uh, dive in on some, uh, you know, some some uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, or I think some, there might be some Kurosawa on there. And yeah, certainly, certainly, plenty of uh, Studio Ghibli. It's definitely a blind spot. So I can't really come to this, you know, like I'm Quentin Tarantino, picking apart this, you know, pastiche of kung fu movies. And, and say, oh, look how, I, I can't say, oh, look at how original this was, because it does seem very familiar, a lot of the action sequences. And, uh, uh, but the set pieces are unique. You know, the, the final, the climactic fight scene between Mulan and, and our, our top bad guy, um, played by Jason Scott Lee. By the way, did you guys recognize Jason Scott Lee from anything? Yeah, so funny enough, in Back to the Future 2, <laughs> Jason Scott Lee plays one of uh, 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 Griff's... It, it plays plays one of Griff's henchmen. <laughs> did, you, <laughs> did you recognize him from this? He or? recognized his face from something. And I'm like, what is going like on 30 here? 30 years ago. Yeah, I know, right? And and when uh, when Michael J. Fox, Marty McFly, is riding the hoverboard over the water, and you hear the guy goes... One of the guys goes, uh, McFly, you know those boys don't work on water. And then our <laughs> Jason Scott Lee yells out from the back... Unless you got power. <laughs> Anyways, that's that's, <laughs> that's good to know. I had no idea. I, I I only mentioned that because there really is a huge laundry list of really accomplished actors that were cast in this, and I think we'll get back to all those battle sequences and 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 action scenes. But where I think the casting of this movie is a true achievement. 
I didn't realize that Jet Li was playing the Emperor. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I didn't either. It. Not until. Yeah, I yeah. didn't recognize him. Yeah, yeah. apparently, uh, in in brief, you know, brief research, he didn't he didn't want to do it. The paycheck wasn't that great, and the role wasn't that great. But his kids convinced him that it was important. Because, you know, how often does Hollywood commit to telling, you know, these types of stories? And he's like, oh, okay, I'll do it. But he doesn't really get to show off his Jet Li. Yeah, it kind of does make me feel like I wish there was like an alternate ending there, right? Where they they both like they team up and they start just kicking butt. Yeah. Uh, so you, you were talking about the witch, Greg. And you've got Lee Gong, who is regarded as probably one of the most... She's sort of regarded as one of the more accomplished actresses in China, playing our our witch. How do you guys feel about her character? I really dug what Greg was uh, mentioning, her fight style. Really unique. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but because I don't remember the original Milan that much, but there's not that character in the original Milan, right? No, there's there the... is the hawk. There is there's the a hawk, hawk, but there's not the personification of the witch. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a nice touch, and I think, I think it also was a good way for uh, them to really kind of drive home the themes of what they're trying to get at by having, you know, a counterpart to Mulan um, in, like, kind of the struggle for uh, being who you are. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it was a nice addition, and I think it gave us a, a good uh, place to explore that character a little bit more. So I was for it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I again, I kind of, to, to echo what Will just said, I think that that character really, it she felt purposeful, and whereas you, you kind of, while I was watching it, I just kept thinking, like, is this character in the original? I don't think so, but, like, she seems really important to the story, so I, I right. was trying to, like, figure out in my head whether or not that character was there, and I just assumed... I had forgotten because of how integral she was to, to this movie. Yeah. I, I, so I have a question because it wasn't really clear to me when she would uh, break up into her, was she breaking up? What, what bird were they crows? Were they bats? I don't know. She's a hawk and then she's her human form. And then she's a bunch of black flying. I mean, that's magic, baby. They, they could have been crows. They could have been bats. You've seen magic camp. I just don't. I just don't know. <laughs> I, I wasn't looking close enough to see if they were bats or crows or, or what was doing with those things. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I but I do think that it was like it, it is interesting because it is such a divergent from what the original story was and 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 not such one because it doesn't really change the story, but it just helps you emphasize different parts of the story. Um, so it felt like a nice narrative tweak. Um, and uh, that alone, I think, is worth anybody that hasn't seen or that has seen the original Mulan uh, to take a look at what this one offers. There were a lot of small character changes and, yeah. and big. That was one of the bigger ones, and there were some other ones where I, I believe in the original Mulan, and I don't, I don't know all the characters' names, so forgive me for that. But uh, I know the original Mulan. You know, she she joins the army, and her kind of love interest character is also the her superior. Say, the general her superior in yeah. the army and in this film they kind of split that into two different characters which i think helps smart the move. dynamic a bit yeah for smart sure smart move i i think yeah. uh i think in this day and age having uh a male superior officer uh fall in love with uh, uh <laughs> a, a someone under them uh doesn't really bode yeah. well in a in a me too era so i think yeah. that was smart Another character change I thought was kind of interesting was there was a character in this movie called Cricket, who was the young, the youngest member of the army, kind of the the baby, the baby face uh, kid, and he's representative of the of Cricky, the Cricket character that appeared in Mulan. That was just kind of his avatar in this film. I thought that was a an interesting choice. I don't remember Cricky from the original. Yeah, it's 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 weird. There, I didn't remember a dog from the original, but there's a dog at the beginning, and then there's a <laughs> okay. cricket. And for for I honestly thought it was just Mushu. I thought it was the dragon, but uh -huh. apparently they've got they've got you know uh, sort of like an Abbott Costello type thing where Mushu and Cricky sort of play comedy off of each other. God, gotcha. um, yeah, okay. When, when we're not, not Disney anymore. animated princess movies, they always have more than one. Uh, little animal sidekick. There's got to be at least two or three. 
And it's always, <laughs> and it, you know, it, a movie like Moana sort of plays on those expectations where we think that the right. the, the pig is going to be going along for the journey and that he's going to be our, our, our sidekick and it ends up being the, the chicken. Right, right, right. The rooster. Really... Um, yeah, so we talked about the cast. We talked about some of the action sequences. I, I thought the cinematography, the production design, the visual effects, th- there were points in the movie where... There are only a few, and, and and the fact that there were only a few is actually a compliment, where I hate when I know that I'm in a CGI universe, unless mm. you've already, unless it's Avengers Endgame, and we've just established that this is one big animated painting of superheroes, right? But the production design, the sets, the wardrobe, they all felt very tangible, that you could reach out and touch them. Uh, there were shots that felt very Ridley Scott esque, like mm, sort of yeah. like early scenes in Gladiator. Uh, but then uh, all of a sudden you would cut to a scene a few minutes later, and you'd feel like you're on the set of 300, where it was. Yeah, it was it was a little inconsistent with the quality of the CGI, where sometimes it looked great, and then there were sometimes where you're like, why did we do this long, sweeping, vast? scene where all of the grass is g- super bright green and CGI. Like, I didn't, we don't need it. You know, there's, th- there was some bad CGI on like the spider. Uh, and I think the most glaring, I think the most glaring instance of, of bad uh, visual effects was, I mean, truthfully, most of that was, it was kind of upfront in the beginning of the movie. But when, when Mulan is a little girl and she's running across the rooftops and she does these like flips off the top and then, it just felt so weirdly stilted and 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 green screened. Uh, whereas once you actually get into the movie and we're having some like real more detailed kung fu fight scenes, they just felt it felt great. But some of that stuff like was kind of really jarring, I thought. Yeah, the parquet, the parquet didn't parkour. really the park, Yeah, sorry, the parkour didn't really work for me. Um, it's funny, you know, watching the original. Mulan. Parquet is a type of butter, I believe. A parquet is also a type of flooring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the Celtics uh, uh, famously play on a parquet oh, floor. Uh, that's okay. uh, yeah. I didn't know that's what that was called. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, parquet. Parkour, so, parquet. So. Eh, whatever. But yeah, parquet is a butter or a butter substitute as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, you know what? I don't think that would work for me. Yeah, so that wasn't that great. The parquet no. was. No, below you, parquet. They they needed some better. Ah. They needed some better butter in 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 Mulan. Um, <laughs> yeah, the parkour didn't quite work for me. But while going back to the original Mulan, you know, the characters in these two movies are very very different, both in their personalities and sort of their motivations. Uh, in the original Mulan, she's sort of clumsy, you know, but she's resourceful. You know, clumsy yet resourceful. Okay, cool. And she sort of goes off to war because she's trying to protect her father because he, she knows that he won't come back. In, in this one, she's more determined. She's got this idea of being something that, you know, society tells her she can't be. And when she takes her father's armor and sword and goes off into war, yes, she's doing it in part to save his life, but also sort of like to prove people wrong. So I don't know how you guys felt about that. I felt that there wasn't a, a great deal of motivation lended to Mulan. Yeah, I think that that, that seems fair now that I think about it retrospectively. Like there, I I think the movie gets away with it because I already know the original story of Mulan. So I don't need to know that all that stuff to be like, of course she's going to go off and do this. But uh, yeah, I think in the early, in the, in the, in the first act before she joins the military, it's not like I really saw that of her just really yearning to do it. I saw maybe she doesn't quite fit in. She goes to the matchmaker and she's like, uh, uh, this isn't really for me, but it, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like she's yearning or she doesn't have that. I want song. Right. Um, where I, where I really get to see her uh, going after a thing that she wants. Um, yeah. I think that that's interesting. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I would say that the first act is a little bit of a slog compared to the rest of the movie. Things, things, you're, it's, it's, it's kind of you're just waiting for it to get to the point where you know it's going to 
be. And when she finally does join the army and get to the training montage and we introduce, you know, the fellow soldiers and we kind of, it, it turns into a more action fun film. Then it, then it really t- starts to, to take off and, and pick up. And, and prior to that, it's just kind of, you're, you're almost going through the motions because you know where it's going and you're just like ready to get there. Yeah, I, and this is probably a good time to bring up a, a huge con. This is not a good script. This is not a good script at all. And it's not... I, I think our our uh, our director, uh, Nikki Caro, sort of is able to rescue us from a bad script because, like, I know we keep saying it, but these battle scenes and action sequences are thrilling. Like when, when Mulan's riding that horse and then she yeah. jumps off to the side of the horse and she's kicking arrows back at people. It's, it's truly, I was excited and, it, and it's yeah. hard to, first off, how cool was it to see a chase scene with horses? When was the last time we saw that? We don't get those kinds of movies anymore. We don't get the kind of sword to sword combat movies anymore. And frankly, I don't think we ever would have gotten this movie if it wasn't Mulan. Right? Like a movie like this could not have gotten made whatsoever if the IP Mulan wasn't already there to build off of. And because of that, you know, that they take out the songs, they take out Mushu, but they didn't really add much to replace that. So when you have these long, uh, exciting battle sequences, the, the big moments, the smaller moments when they're just sort of chilling out or you know, she's in, in the lake and right. she's with the fellas and they're talking about the, the girls they, they want. Like, they're just, the dialogue's really clunky. The dialogue is either very clunky or incredibly boring. <laughs> like, there's no, there's no, you know, there, there's no, those are your two choices when you're watching Mulan. Clunky yeah. or boring. Yeah, it, like, the story was all there, but it just felt, it almost felt like a first draft hmm. where yeah. they just went like, this is the story. This is about what the line should be here. And they, that was the script. And they just went like, good, we'll do Mulan. Everyone's going to like it. Who cares? We're already spending $200 million on it. <laughs> yeah. It needed, it needed a serious punch up. It needed, it needed a little bit more depth because again, I think they were just leaning and relying on the fact that it's Mulan. It's Disney. We all know the story and, and people are going to go see it no matter what. And they, and, and then they like, Again, they put a hell of a lot of work into the the action side of it to yeah. to make it something that ultimately proves to be really exciting and and for the most part, it's a pretty fun watch. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely go back and watch those action sequences again, but I will. Yeah, I will go fast forward through those dialogue scenes. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you talk, you hear people talk about Saving Private Ryan, right? And Saving Private Ryan is same thing. Some some really just visceral war scenes. And then you've got like moments that sort of, uh, uh, they fill the gap, but they're not great. They're good. I'm not prepared. Because... I'm not prepared to shit on Saving Private Ryan I... at all. <laughs> I'm not shitting on it. I've never what seen I, what it. I, what, so... I'm, what, I, what I'm saying well, is, what, well, I'm well, say... well. <laughs> what I'm saying is that in Saving Private Ryan, you've got some real talent there to, to to save some dialogue that some people might just sort of think is very vanilla, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but this movie doesn't have that talent. Like they, you've got some, uh, like Tai Ma. Tai Ma plays Mulan's father, and he's, he's great. He's, 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 he's been in everything. everything. He's yeah. been in everything. We know him from everything, and you know we talk about having facials as an actor. And, and he really brings a gravitas to his character to give it more weight than the script really gives it. The script doesn't give him much to work with. That's true. So you can have a great actor elevate, you know, what is, you know, Greg doesn't like hearing that because he's a, he's a writer. Like, he <laughs> no, it's he, true. It's no, I, of course it's true. Um, <laughs> I will. I'll just. I'll just for the people listening who don't know him by name because I don't think many people do. You know, you you'd seen him in Rush Hour and Rush Hour Two. Uh, he's in RoboCop Two. Twenty Four. Uh, yeah, he's on Twenty Four. He's he was in on Dante's Veep. Peak. He's in all kinds of stuff. He's in everything. He's in Dante's Peak. He is. 
Oh, man, I used to watch that a lot in, like, middle school. The dude has an insane amount of credits. And, and you know, th there's something to be said about that. The reason why these guy, guy like him has so many credits is because there are so few Asian American actors that get a chance. So it's like, hey, we've got this Chinese role. Who are we going to call? We got to get Tai Ma. Is he available? Mm. Sure. Great. And, you know, you got the guy who's a... Uh, plays the Chinese food restaurant uh, host in the Seinfeld episode, who's like 96 years old now and has like a thousand credits and people are trying to get know. him up. People are trying to get him a star on the Hollywood walk of fame because of it. That's but it's cool. just like, I love that these guys have all these credits, but it's just sort of f that there aren't opportunities right. for so many more people to jump into those roles. But for sure, I guess that's why we make a movie like Mulan. I have a, a nitpick if we want to throw that in there. Yeah, go ahead. While we're talking about things that didn't work, cons, yes. like the screenplay, I've got a, a very minute thing that I think was dumb. Um, okay, so <laughs> here's the premise. Milan's uh, dad is going to gonna go in the morning to join up with the army after like that day the army comes around they're like we need one man from each household he's like i'm gonna go do it and mulan's like no i'm gonna do it instead i'm gonna get out ahead of you she gets on her horse and goes by herself on this journey like where are the other people that are joining this army with you <laughs> like where's oh, the yeah. army you got to go on this big journey she gets lost the phoenix has to point her in the right direction i'm just like this doesn't make sense logistically <laughs> Well, there are a Sorry. lot of things that don't it's make dumb. sense logistically get in the movie because, you know, it is a Disney movie. So yeah, for sure. the whole idea that when Mulan realizes she needs to become Mulan to really harness all of her chi, mm -hmm. she starts shedding armor. Yeah, like, that what too. are you doing? You're, you're, you're riding your horse back into battle. You're throwing your armor to the ground. You're going to need she it. She sheds her armor. She blows out her hair. Her hair her is face. down. Her face is suddenly made up with beautiful makeup and lipstick. Uh, she's she's the woman she was inside. But you know what? Uh, I, <laughs> what what do we love about movies like Rocky Four? You know what do we love mm -hmm. about you know Rambo movies? We want. I haven't that, seen either of those. So. You know, we, we want those moments. Well, you never seen here. Rocky Four? <laughs> well, you gotta watch Rocky Four, dude. Dude, Rocky IV is the Is best. that the one with the Russian? Yes. Yeah. If, if he okay, dies, I have seen that dies. one because I came over for a 4th of July party one day at Garrett's. And uh, we watched okay. we had Independence Day and Rocky IV right. on. So. Funny, funny story. <laughs> I, I, I watched uh, 1917 last year in theaters sitting next to Dolph Lundgren. Oh. Yeah. Funny. That's it. Uh, I'm going to throw out one last criticism uh, because, of, honestly, I don't have that many. But I will say that... And again, maybe this this uh, this is kind of counter to the other things I've said about loving all of the action sequences. But there were certain points in it where there, the action was going on, and 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 then you know it ends with like someone getting punched and falling. And I'm so used to watching R-rated action <laughs> yeah. that I felt like I was they were holding back. Because I mean, they are they are holding back. It's a Disney movie for to watch with your family, but but part of me was going like, "Where's the blood spurt?" I maybe I'm watching too much Lone Wolf and Cub, but I just <laughs> there were there were moments where I was like, "There should be blood spurting out of that guy's neck right now," and instead it was just kind of you know he falls to the ground in a thud. There's no there's no viscera, uh, yeah. and I understand why, but but my instinct was like, "Ah, just push it a little farther." I felt the same way, but I think ultimately this is kind of the, the movie for a kid that's like grown up past cartoons, but not quite ready for, for that movie yet. So Yeah, not ready for Mortal Kombat. You yeah. know what it kind of reminded me of, and, and I, I see where you're coming from, Greg, but for me it sort of reminded me of uh, a, a movie that came out in 1998, uh, Mask of Zorro, which is really underrated movie, and... We, we used to have these fun PG-13 action movies that would have a, a unique quality about them. You know, we don't get those anymore. Now we get Transformers and four more of them. Um, so I was just happy that I was getting a little bit of Ridley Scott mixed with Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, seeing some like arrows go into some dudes and falling off horses, old school style that didn't if there was CGI helping along the way, it wasn't noticeable to me. And that's, that's all I ask for. I just, if you're going to fool me, fool me. But yeah, 
so uh, we talked about how this movie borrows from kung fu and and Chinese cinema. You know, Ang Lee was originally desired to direct the project, but he turned it down due to scheduling. And I think that we 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 landed on a female director, albeit not a, a female director of Asian descent. Um, but I thought Nikki Caro did a, a hell of a job. Now Nikki Caro holds the record for the highest budgeted movie directed by a woman, with this movie being $200 million. And I know for the past few years, it's definitely been a, 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 a hot topic of discussion where, especially on Twitter, and I've always criticized it for one reason. And it's always like, look at the top 25 highest grossing movies of all time and see how many are directed by women. And I'm like, okay. Now, let's not blame the audiences here. If we're trying to change the way this business works, let's start looking at Hollywood, and let's start looking at the top 25 highest budgeted movies that are directed by women, and there are zero women in there. On that, that list. Yeah, that makes sense. You're judging the outcome. Um not the not the input right so right. that that's the way other people were doing it so yeah it makes sense to take a look at that yeah it needs to be more representation in those in those big budget movies and then the the results will follow yeah like i, I hate i hate that the blame automatically fall, falls on you know the audience like it's not maybe the movie was marketed poorly like yeah. it's not our fault you know whose fault it is it's it's your fault studio exec for not putting a big budget behind a female director that's the problem that's and maybe this will help change that, right? I mean, I think that's the the thing about Hollywood, I think, is that they're always a little bit, they're always cautious about money. And that's why we see uh, sequels, because it's like, well, I can guarantee that this that this is going to make me money, because that name's on it or whatever. That's why you see the same kind of stuff repeated and repeated. So it takes this happening. Um, and, I mean, we don't know yet. We don't know how successful Mulan will be on the Disney Plus service. Um, but I'm going to guess it's going to do pretty well. Um, and I could see that this could kind of, uh, work in that favor and, and hopefully start a trend that way. Yeah, when, when it comes to these these issues that Hollywood loves to talk about and and champion, you know, it's it's sort of the it, it's sort of the running joke when you live in LA, and you know you get the text, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be there in five minutes, and the person's really like twenty minutes away. That's sort of how Hollywood is with social issues. They yeah. say like, hey, we're 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 five minutes away from being perfect when you have no idea how far away you are and how far you need to go. And, you know, the question is, are you even willing to go that far? Because it seems like when it's popular, it's popular. And then when it's not, it's sort of just, you know, the, the, the fire goes down and you just got some embers waiting to ignite again. Will mentioned that, you know, you, ex you expect this to be successful on Disney+. Plus. I mean, Premiere yeah, Access. I so. How popular do you think Premiere Access will be? So Variety estimates that they need eight and a half million subscribers. So that's roughly fourteen percent of Disney Plus subscribers to unlock Premiere Access <laughs> in order to to break even. So if you're a betting person, you know you're, you're putting a bet down. Are you betting for the over or the under? Eight and a half million. I think that the Disney fan base, the Disney subscriber base, um, I think there's a big, there's obviously a large rabid, rabid fan base percentage that's baked into that. And on, and on top of that, there's just the people who have kids and want to make sure that their kids are getting all of that Disney content and they're getting the newest stuff and, and they, you know, don't have to worry uh, that they're that they're not going to be you know uh, the the cool kid in school. Of course, schools is happening via Zoom nowadays. But but even still, uh, I think that I think fourteen percent of their of their subscriber base doesn't seem like that high a number for them to break even. And I think is is this not going to get released in theaters at all? Is it is it also getting like a small? It's getting um, a small release in theaters, and of course worldwide, like it's opening in China. So, so when when they talk about breaking even, quote unquote, I think we're talking like domestically, uh, you know, getting that two hundred million dollar budget back domestically. Yeah, because I mean, once it goes to China, they're not going to have a problem. Right. I think it's it's gonna it's gonna kill it over there. 
Yeah. But and, yeah. yeah, I mean, Disney are Disney Plus subscribers going to do it? I think you could get one out of ten to do it. Hey, we got one out of three here. One so. out of three. <laughs> I mean, if we didn't have this podcast, what are the chances you guys would have unlocked Premiere Access? Zero percent. Zero. 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 For me, it might have been a conversation in our household, you know? I know that I've watched Mulan. My fiancé... My fiancé has yet to watch it. We sort of have a rule now going where I sort of get very frustrated when I'm trying to work viewing times around her schedule and desire to really sit down and and focus on something. So my philosophy now, and I don't know how couples, uh, how couples out there do it, but for me, I, I say, listen, if, if something is worth watching, if, if I think something is worth her watching, it means that I think it's worth me watching again. Right? Sure. So, I mean, I'll sit down and watch Mulan with her. I mean, I won't pay the closest attention, but, you know, I, I watched a I watched a lot of movies this weekend. It's this heat wave. I'm just sitting on the couch trying to keep cool. I mean, I watched Capturing the Freedmans yesterday, which is one of the more depressing documentaries ever made, followed up with City of Angels. I don't know why. And then watched Dave. So you're talking about... <laughs> <laughs> a weird, Might as well, right? A sure. weird trilogy of movies, then following it up with two versions of Mulan the day after. You, you have a lot of options out there. So when you're talking about a lot of options and you're talking about trying to get eight and a half million people to drop 30 bucks to watch one movie that in 90 days will be available. I don't know. I think, I think 15, 14% is the right number. I think if that number was closer to 22%, Disney would not have done this because that's that's close to one in four. And I think that is, that's a tough nut to crack. But, you know, tomorrow we could be waking up to a deadline article that blows us all away. We'll find out. We will I'm, find I, out. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask my sister because she has Disney Plus and has kids. And uh, my theory is that when someone pulls it up, and they see the banner that says Milan, and they're like, oh, let's click in. And they've got the kids around. Let's click in. Oh, I got to pay for this? Ugh, uh, sure. That's that's my theory on how they get to 14%. And I don't know. Maybe Beth will go through that. Maybe she won't. But if she does, I will let you guys know. Yeah, I mean, if you're, pull, if you're pulling up Disney Plus and your kids see it, see that banner up top. Yep. And then you tell them, oh, let's watch Mulan. And then you tell them, ooh, we have to wait three months. I don't think that's going to go over too well. Yeah. I think. That and it, at this point, it's all like kid management, you know, with, totally. uh, with, with this point in the quarantine. The I weird think. thing is with the title of Mulan, if it were called anything else and you showed that trailer to a kid, I don't even think they would care. Yeah, probably but, not. But simply because it is Disney's Mulan, that changes the entire conversation around whether or not a kid needs to see it and how quickly they need to see it. So I want to go a step further there, and I'm actually glad you brought up this point. I would go further and say there are just a lot of adults, a lot of white American adults, that if they saw that trailer and there was not Mulan attached to it, they would just have zero interest, you know, and, and for many reasons, True. for for all kinds of reasons. But I think, you know, we know that there's a big segment of population that's just like, why do I care about a a period piece war movie that takes place in China? And frankly, I might be one of those people, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I might be one of those people like, do I really need to see Braveheart in China? Do I need that? I don't know. Um, but by having Mulan on there, having that IP, having that cachet, that's what got the movie made, and that's when it, that's what's ultimately going to get the movie seen. Yeah, that's true. So I think we should close out with with some of the controversies that that have gone along with with this Mulan remake, which unfortunately. I, I'm not that interested in talking about them because I'm not that educated about them. So yeah. for, for in the interest of not saying the wrong thing, I'd rather say as little as possible. Um, months ago, you had Lou uh, Ife, who is the star, our Mulan. She expressed support for Hong Kong police during a time when 
It was believed police were violating some human rights against some pro-democracy okay. protesters. I, Garrett, I think it's okay to say they were, in fact, violating human rights against protesters. There you go. I don't think it's crazy to take a side on this because we're seeing the same thing happen here in the United States of America where the police and other uh, and other uh, militar- militarized forces are, in fact, violating human rights against protesters pro-democracy uh and, and uh, protesters it, it happens it's happening there it's happening here uh and and the reasons that that Lu Yi Ife might be siding or might have spoken out is because there's a lot of s- internal and external societal pressure for you to not speak out against the people in charge over there and and whether or not she did show support for the police again it's like that doesn't mean she necessarily does. She just might find that it's probably the best diplomatic thing to say at the moment. And some would disagree. Uh, or, but I don't, I don't even want to judge her on it. Or the simplest answer. It's she, hard. She didn't know enough about the issue. And maybe she shouldn't have chimed in. Which, you know what? A lot of you should take that advice. A <laughs> lot of you out there. I should, should just take, take the advice. advice. Where you don't need to chime in on every single subject. Uh, and, and then uh, this past weekend, when the movie actually premiered, uh, if you go to the end credits, there are some special thanks given to government agencies in Xinjiang, where they, they filmed uh, some of the movie, where there is a lot of evidence of Muslim internment camps designed to indoctrinate the Muslim population in the region. So those two stories have sort of brought forth this... Uh, if you went on Twitter this weekend, you had Mulan trending only because it was a promoted trending topic paid for mm. by Disney. And then you had hashtag boycott Mulan trending on Twitter. Um, the only reason I want to talk about those two stories is because I don't think it's going to affect who watches this movie whatsoever. I don't think the the general audience that is going to open up Disney Plus and pay $30 to watch Mulan is following either one of those stories close enough to let alone care about them. And I think the exception might exist here in the town we live in with uh, people who are both Disney fanatics, but are also uh, staunch supporters of, of uh, human rights. Yes, but you're also, you're, you're but that's not a large enough thing to affect. I think their, their bottom dollar. You're, you're leaving out though, the vast number of hypocrites we have on this town. (laughs) (laughs) That is true. I mean, this, this town is, is filled with hypocrites. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see if the, the hashtag boycott Mulan thing. I mean, Disney has gotten a little close to, the Chinese government when it comes to these movies, like really working with them. Uh, you saw the, the NBA was, was in bed with, with oh, the Chinese yeah. government. And then you saw what happened with that when there was one shred of criticism, uh, the Chinese government pushed back and said like, uh, no, we're not going to stream your games. And the NBA lost like a billion dollars because of it. Um, it, we, we're definitely living in some odd times, Ultimately, here at the D Plus cast, we are pro human rights. We are pro democracy. We are pro inclusion. We are pro representation. Um, are we pro remake after this? This this one. Did this remake work for you? Yes. Um, it didn't work for me in the way that I'm going to want to watch it a lot, uh, many more times. And if I'm going to choose between one of the two, I will probably go with the original. But I, like you said, I will go back and watch the action scenes from this one. But I'm pro this in the way that it didn't feel like a beat by beat remake. There were different there were differences to it. And if you're going to remake an old story like that, that's what I want to see. I wanted to see the story evolve and to change in different ways. And yeah, maybe there's some issues with the script. Um, but beyond that, I, I, I land on the side of, sure, give me more of this. I'm, like I said, 1953 Peter Pan. I know they've remade that a million times, but sure, let's try that again and see if we can get it right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat. I think that this did a really good job of, of kind of reinventing uh, the original without 
without being exactly the same as it. Uh, if they were to do it again, uh, I would hope that A, it was at least 15, 20 years from now before we touch on this again, because I don't know that it has legs to just, just be one of those ones that you could just keep making over and over and over again. And if they did, I don't know what a different take would be unless you decided to pivot, uh, you know, pivot to an R rated one or, 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 or make, you know, make a big bold change like that. Maybe, maybe it doesn't take place in the same era and you can find a way to, to still stay true to the, all the, all the Chinese culture, but put, set it in a different period. So that way it, it won't, it won't ultimately look like this and, and it'll feel totally different. I'm, I'm, I'm open to these things, but I, Anytime that there's anything being remade, I always want it to be like far off in the distance. Yeah. Sure. Uh, personally, I think, and you guys may disagree, I think this would have made a better 10 episode Disney Plus series. I think a lot of, I think sure. a lot of the That's stuff it. that, that is weak in the script feels rushed. Yeah. And I mean, you could take this movie apart and do an hour just just living in Mulan's everyday life. I feel like we don't learn enough about her, her village, uh, the, the, the culture. I feel like there's so much more to explore within there. And then you could have one of these battle scenes be an entire episode, just like Game of Thrones did. So Yeah, for sure. I would like I them to I would like them to be a little, you know, take some risks with their remakes. Maybe not automatically throw two hundred million dollars in a movie and maybe, you know, throw some money at a sto- telling the story over a longer period of time. I mean, if you could take a TV show like The Fugitive and 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 turn it into a movie, you could take a movie and turn it into a TV show. We can do this. We've seen it done before. Yeah, and I mean, you got you you can't ignore the fact that they they, they developed this to be seen in theaters, yeah. right? And and that ultimately was my biggest takeaway is that this movie felt like I should have seen it in theaters. It was a spectacle. Um and it didn't quite work on my laptop for those purposes, but that's all to say like that was in the design of, of the production of this movie. And maybe if they were to do it again, knowing what they know now, they might do a 10 episode kind of thing like that. And I think it's worth considering for future things. In the first act of this movie, there's, there's some really great cinematography that reminded me a lot of, uh, 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 Martin Scorsese's The Age of Innocence, which is based on an Edith Wharton novel. And a lot of that movie is the camera from above looking down at, at tables and, and, and place settings and, and dishware and elegance and and i feel like we got a lot of that in in the beginning of this movie this really elegant way of of showing respect to to cultural items where i mean you know listen now every instagrammer is like oh you mean you mean a flat lay yeah there were a lot of flat lays done yeah (laughs) but you know i feel like there, there could be a whole episode just exploring the the important cultural aspects that really they just don't have time to explore in this movie. Yeah, and I, I honestly expected that. I expected the uh, visual cues from the beginning to come up and play a parallel set towards the end when she, you know, they have that moment of when she's getting ready um, to go to the matchmaker. And I guess, is that a flat lay when it's like looking down and has all the different pieces? I expected to see that, but with like military equipment as she's getting ready for war, I expected to see those, that parallel um, delivery. But, but yeah, no, I would have loved to, to, to dive into more detail around that stuff. Yeah. I mean, ultimately I just would have liked to have spent more time with Milan. Sure. If they could punch up that script. So is this our best Disney remake to date? You know, I've this is the only one I've seen. Yeah. Nah, Jungle Book. You see, you would still put Jungle Book ahead. Yeah, Jungle Book's a blast. I love okay. it. You know, I I have to revisit Jungle Book. I I remember seeing it and loving it. To me, I just thought that. I don't know. I just I I thought these are some of the best action sequences I've seen on screen in a while. Um, there's yeah. definitely some some editing there to hide some things, which you know I can see, but not a lot of people are looking for it. But you know, it's a hell of a good time. Yeah. We'll re-release this podcast in December for when everybody else watches it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should just re-release this in December yeah. and, and change some details. 
Yeah. Uh, we, we'll talk about, you know, we'll change the, the temperature conversation in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Yeah. I don't hopefully. think we will. I don't think we will. <laughs> so what do you, ultimately, do you guys think, what do you guys think this does to the theater business? Honestly, for me, as uh, having just mentioned, I felt like I should have seen it in theaters. It makes me miss theaters more. It do, it done. It did not have the effect that I expected it to, which is like, oh, I don't need theaters. It was like, oh, this is the kind of this is why I need a theater because I need these big Ridley Scott shots and this these big action sequences. I need to be fully immersed in this because watching watching this on my laptop is fine, but it makes the weak script show up more uh, versus the, the impressive visuals. Um, so I don't know if it has a big effect on the movie theater, but that's what it, the effect it had on me. Again, I mean, we've had this conversation before. I think it's just, it's really just hard to say because we are, this isn't a normal time. We, I watched it at home. I mean, we, mind you, it was through your account, but would I have gone to the theater to see it? I, I don't think so. I don't think it would have been on my agenda. Uh, and I did see it this way, so um, it's 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 not really something I could put my finger on and say like this is going to be the new way people watch movies, as opposed to you know going to the theater like we used to. I just think that it, we we are we are living in such a strange time that this is this is this is a test run, but but if the world returns back to normal. Who knows? We might, you know, we might go back to the old days, and 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 we'll, I, I mean, I'm excited to go to the movie theater again someday. I know I want to do it, and I know I want to see big screen movies, and and uh, I don't think that this is going to be the permanent landing place for for a two. I don't think anyone will ever produce a two hundred million dollar movie with the intent of you watching it at home. No, no, you know, not at all. Well, that'll do it for the D Plus cast. Uh, Greg, do you have anything to plug? Uh, no, just hit me up on Twitter at It's Greg Hahn. Will, how about you? Oh, you know. Just this podcast, Just my this dude. podcast, man. Well, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at D Plus Cast. Like us on Facebook. Smash that subscribe button on YouTube. And please, don't forget. Rate. Review. Subscribe. Leave a review. Even if you hate us. No, don't, don't do it if you hate us. But if you like us, leave a review. It helps us bring more listeners in here, and uh, that's what we want. We want people to like us, because we're trying to fill a void that we've yet to find something to fill it. Right? That's why we do this? Yeah, pretty much. Maybe? Okay. Well, we have some exciting shows coming up. We'll talk to you soon.